Uh, thanks very much. Thanks for the invitation to be here. And it's always a tough gig to give the first talk of the day the morning after a social event. So it's nice to see everyone here bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. Okay, so I'll, I'll be um, uh, introducing you to the Madden-Julian Oscillation. Can I have a show of hands? Who, who's familiar with the Madden-Julian Oscillation? Okay, probably half of you, maybe a bit less than half. Okay, good. So I'll, I'll be covering uh, a fair broad range, uh, right from basics, uh, basic introduction, right through to some of the more complex um, ideas. And if you forget Madden-Julian Oscillation or MJO, um, just, just think Mojo, and there's a reason for that. I'll tell you halfway through the talk why that's a good way to remember it. Okay, so I'll, I'll give a brief overview, as I mentioned, uh, short history and outline some of the general characteristics, uh, and then introduce the ocean response. So the MJO is, is primarily an atmospheric disturbance uh, in the tropics, which I'll tell you about in just a moment. So there is an ocean response and, um, and some, some, some proposed theories on uh, SC feedback. I'll then talk about some of the broader global impacts, so not just within the tropics, but uh, out, outside in the, in the extra tropics. Uh, then talk about measuring and monitoring and predicting the MJO and how, how we've been able to do that, particularly over the last 10 years in terms of predicting uh, with the introduction of, um, of a really nice uh, index for measuring the MJO. And then I'll, I'll summarise and um, give you some, uh, some, some references to a bit of further reading if, if you're interested. Okay, so first of all, an overview. So, so the MJO, the Madden-Julian Oscillation, it's a, it's, a, it's a large atmospheric disturbance in the tropics and it's in fact the, the, the largest mode of intraseasonal or subseasonal variability in the tropics. So by subseasonal we're talking about greater than two weeks in terms of its periodicity uh, and shorter than a season. So in, in 1970, uh, Roland Madden and Paul Julian, who, who work or worked at NCAR, in the, in the US. They were looking for modes of tropical variability on time sc scales greater than two weeks. Um, and they had um, daily pressure and upper air data from Canton Island in the um, tropical Pacific. And so they were looking essentially for, for, for pulses in a 10-year data set. Um, and what they found was that there was, there was a pulse on about 41 to 53 day time scales. This is what they narrowed it down to at the time. So using uh, spectral analyses of, of these fields, they were able to find this, this, this peak of variability on, on, on this time scale, about 40 to 50 days. Uh, and it came as a complete surprise. They, didn't, they, they, you know, they weren't expecting it at all. So they described this as a large zonal circulation cell at the time in their 1971 paper, and that was the first publication on this uh, phenomenon. And there's, there's Canton Island there with the red flashing star. And then in, in 1972, they, they expanded this further. They looked at other stations around the tropics, and they described more of its characteristics. And what, what they found by looking across the tropical um, Indo-Pacific, so that's ranging you know, from the Indian Ocean to the uh, Western Central and uh, a little bit into the Eastern Pacific. Um, so the warm pool, the tropical warm pool, as you'd know, uh, incorporates the, um, uh, the, largely the, the um, Eastern Indian Ocean to the Western to Central Pacific. Uh, and what they found by, by looking at this station data was that there was a clear eastward moving signal. Um, so so in, their, in their data, they found um, the anomalies uh, start to develop over the Indian Ocean, uh, propagate eastward uh, across, across the maritime continent where there was an intensification of the anomalies that they were looking at, uh, into the eastern Pacific. And it was c confined to about plus or minus 10, 10 degrees. So, uh, either side of the equator. It was clearly a tropical phenomenon. And they broadened the period by, by looking at various stations. They saw that the period of this oscillation uh, varied between about 30 and 60 days. So this is, this, this is the schematic. This is how they, how they um, depicted the Madden-Julian oscillation. Of course, it wasn't called that then, but subsequently it became called the, the MJO. Um, and and, and the way that they depicted this was with this schematic. It's um, essentially um, a, a, a slice along the equator, so as a function of longitude down the bottom and, and vertical um, height. So what they showed was, was that over the Indian Ocean, so the top two panels, there was a, a build-up of deep convection. Um, and this, this propagated eastward, further intensified over the maritime continent uh, in, the, in panels H and A. Uh, and then 
further, further down the screen, as we propagate further eastward, they found that the, that the convective signal um, decayed uh, or started to reduce uh, over, over the Western Pacific. The Western Pacific it decayed uh, around, around the dateline, and then um, further east, uh, the signal was um, uh, in, in the convection. It, it was virtually absent, but, but uh, the signal was still present in the large-scale circulation. So they found that, that the fields that, um, that showed the largest, um, um, I guess the most coherent uh, structure, are uh, deep convection or outgoing long-wave radiation, which is a good proxy for deep convection, and lower atmosphere zonal wind and upper atmosphere zonal wind. So they found these large uh, anomalous uh, circulation cells, um, so low-level low convergence into the convective region and then upper-level divergence. And they found this entire coupled um, convective circulation system move eastward uh, across the tropical uh, Indian and Pacific Oceans. And on the right there, I'm just showing the rainfall uh, anomalies associated with, it, with each of those uh, stages of its propagation. Uh, so you can see, so what I'm showing here in the blue is um, increased rainfall or, or positive rainfall anomalies. And so associated with that deep convection, we have an increase of rainfall uh, over the Indian Ocean, uh, propagating eastward to the maritime continent, further eastward to the Western Pacific. And um, further east, you can see the, the rainfall anomalies start to die away. Uh, but we have a suppression of, um, of uh, rainfall over the maritime continent uh, in those, in those um, phases shown towards the bottom of the screen. So the MJO was, was depicted, as I mentioned, using these eight panels. And in 2004, Matthew Wheeler and <coughs> Harry Hendon from the Bureau, uh, they, they developed a really nice index, which I mentioned before that I'll go into more detail uh, about towards, towards the end. And... Um, they, they depicted the MJO using eight different phases of propagation, and, and, that's, and that's, that's how we refer to the MJO and its, its um, life cycle today. We, we uh, refer to it in, in various phases, from phase one to phase eight, to, to, to describe uh, ge you know, geographically where it is at any point in time um, over the tropics. Uh, so I'll, I'll go into that in, in, in more detail soon. But um, phases two and three um, correspond to the MJO convection over the Indian Ocean. Phases four and five... Uh, over the maritime continent, six and seven over the Western Pacific, um, and uh, eight and one uh, over the, the remaining areas of, of the tropics before, um, before re-emerging over the Indian Ocean as it propagates eastward around the globe. Okay, so where does the MJO fit into um, equatorial wave theory? So in 1966, Matsuno documented structures of equatorial waves. Um, using a shallow water model, which is described, uh, described by equations of motion and mass conservation, uh, in, the, in the tropics. And, and essentially there are certain solutions that come out of this shallow water model. And these are the various waves that we observe over the tropics. So, so we know that there are eastward moving Kelvin waves, um, westward moving uh, uh, Rossby waves, and other waves that I won't go into in, in this talk. And these all fit um, into the wave dispersion um, uh, analysis and diagram. Uh, here I'm showing down the bottom a subsequent analysis that Matt Wheeler and George Kalaitis produced in 1999, where they were looking at convectively coupled waves. So what they did is that they took um, the outgoing long wave radiation, as I mentioned, a good proxy for deep convection, and they performed a fast Fourier transform analysis. So this, this um, describes the, the dominant modes of propagation um, with regards to um, their periodicity and their wave number by, by performing this um, FFT on a, on a space-time field. And what, what, what popped out are the same solutions that Matsuno um, documented. So, so the right-hand side of that plot, um, the, the, uh, the, the signal that I've, I've um, circled in green, though that's, that's the eastward propagating uh, wave, uh, wave number space. And so, so what comes out of there are um, equatorial Kelvin waves, uh, which, which propagate at a speed of about 12 to 22 metres per second. And on the left side of that uh, diagram uh, are westward moving waves. And um, uh, so, what, so what comes out of there, which I've circled, are the equatorial Rossby waves, which rotate about the vertical, um, and they're um, associated with cyclogenesis. And what also came out, which, which wasn't documented in 1966, is the MJO signal. So this is clearly 
a convectively coupled wave in the tropics, and it occurs distinct from these other um, equatorial wave um, curves. So the MJO importantly propagates eastward, like, like Kelvin waves, but there are a lot, but it, it, it propagates a lot slower than Kelvin waves, at um, about five meters per second over, over the Indo-Pacific, um, as opposed to 12 to 22 meters per second. So that, that has raised a lot of a lot of interest, and um, you know it, it's presented a lot of questions about what causes the MJO. You know exactly where does it fit into equatorial wave theory? It's it it propagates eastward like Kelvin waves, but it's a lot slower. And uh, importantly, the other the other feature that I'll introduce to you now is that the MJO is a gill-like response to tropical heating. So in 1980, um, Gill documented theoretic, uh, th theoretical coupled um, Kelvin waves um, and Rossby waves as a, uh, as I said, as a coupled system uh, in response to atmospheric heating over, uh, over the tropics um, along the equator. So, so when you have um, atmospheric heating, so for instance in the case of the MJO um, you would have deep, deep convection, um, atmospheric heating and we see to the east of the convection a Kelvin wave-like structure and to the west, a Rossby, a Rossby wave-like structure, and so this this looks very much like like the Gill model uh, response to tropical heating. So it's clear that Kelvin and Rossby wave structures are a dynamical feature of the MJO, and I'll talk soon about about how we often see tropical cyclones develop in association with with um, with with the MJO, particularly over the eastern Indian and western Pacific oceans. So, so the MJO is characterised by atmospheric heating over the equatorial Indo-Pacific warm pool. It moves eastward as a coupled system uh, out to the central Pacific where uh, be, beyond that point convection is lo no longer supported. Uh, and from that point on we actually see a free Kelvin wave then propagate to the east. So it breaks away from that convective coupled envelope and to the west we see Rossby waves then um, shoot off and do their own thing. But as I mentioned the MJO propagates slower than a Kelvin wave. Uh, and the question is why, and 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 more so, you know, what's what's the energy source for the MJO? You know, how how does it come about? And and doubt does remain, and this is still an area of active research. Um, so I guess that there are two two perspectives really. One one is that the MJO might be internally forced within the tropics, and um, within its own um, its own um, convective environment. Uh, another idea then is that maybe it's not, maybe it's externally forced. So some of the internally forced ideas, theories that, that are being looked at is, is um, that there may be local sources of, of convection that, 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 that grow um, due to um, instabilities. So there may be this kind of um, coupled feedback. Uh, so possibly there is um, boundary layer moisture convergence. So to the east of the MJO, um, as, as it propagates eastward to the east, we have clear skies, we have increased solar radiation, we have um, a warmer ocean, uh, positive ocean anomalies, which I'll show you in just, just a moment, um, positive SST anomalies, and um, we, we can see some, uh, in, some instability in that lower atmosphere. So, so we can see some, some moisture convergence possibly, maybe also some surface evaporation, um, maybe one or the other, or maybe both, and I'll go into that in just a little bit more in just a moment. Uh, otherwise, there may be some external forces. So, these, so the idea of externally forced MJO convection is probably uh, a bit less, less um, uh, popular than the idea of, of um, internal forcing. But there have been some, some, some papers that have looked at possibly you know, some, some short-lived local convection that, 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 that fires off some, some um, feedback, maybe associated with the Indian monsoon. Uh, or there may be some interaction with the, with the mid-latitudes. We know that there are sources of, very strong sources of variability outside the tropics, and maybe some of these um, interact with the tropics to generate the MJO. But, but as I mentioned at the moment, um, the, the majority of thinking is that the MJO is likely to be uh, internally forced. So those are some of the general characteristics, and I'll move on to the ocean response. I mentioned the underlying sea surface temperatures. Uh, and, and some of the ideas about air sea feedback that may uh, support convection. So this is, um, this is really just a schematic um, of 
of the MJO at a snapshot in time. So the, the black contours represent the deep convection, so the convective centre of the MJO. As I mentioned, in the lower atmosphere we have, we have um, convergence, uh, so zonal convergence into that region, upper level divergence away from that convective region in the zonal space. And to the east, as I mentioned, we have uh, positive sea surface temperature anomalies, and so those are highlighted there uh, using the orange and the red uh, shading. And to the west, we have negative SST anomalies. And what we see are that these, these sea surface temperature anomalies propagate eastward with the MJO. So we see this, this activity particularly strong over the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, we also see it related to the intertropical convergence zone. So during our summertime, the ITCZ shifts south of the equator, where the maximum solar heating is. Uh, and during our winter time, the ITCZ shifts north of the equator. Uh, and we see the MJO activity also shift. So during our summertime, the, which is what this schematic depicts, we see that centre of convection uh, around 10 degrees south. And during our winter time, it, it's um, propagating eastward around 10 degrees north. We, we also see a preference for our summer period. Uh, so, so during our summer, the MJO has its, has, has its strongest um, uh, activity. And we see, as I mentioned, a, uh, a strong relationship between sea surface temperature, deep convection, and this large zonal circulation. So behind, or to the west, of the MJO as it propagates east, uh, so behind the, the large-scale the large convection, of course, we've had a reduction in incoming solar radiation. So this is why we have uh, a negative sea surface temperature anomaly that, that just follows the MJO as such uh, to, to, to the west. And to the east, as I mentioned, clear skies and calm wind. Uh, and so we have warming. We have increased solar, um, uh, solar, solar radiation into the ocean uh, to, the, to the east. And so we see this, this um, system uh, move eastward with, um, with these varying sea surface temperatures. So se several studies in the past, over the last uh, 20 years, have demonstrated the contribution of these SST anomalies, which are the impact of, or, or you know, a result of, of the atmospheric um, um, MJO anomalies, actually then feed back into the growth of large-scale convection. Uh, by increasing the available moisture to the east and we see a build-up of surf surface zonal convergence and, um, uh, and in some cases uh, increased evaporation over the warm water. And so this has gone into the idea of, 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 of air sea feedback which can intensify the MJO. Uh, and these studies that I've um, highlighted down the bottom have indeed shown that when you have an atmosphere only model and you you know, and the model generates an MJO. When, when you then couple an ocean to that model, uh, in these studies, the, the MJO simulation has been improved through that coupling process with, with the ocean. So this is one such um, uh, proposed mechanism. Uh, and, and a couple of authors, um, including myself and Harry Hendon uh, and Dwayne, Dwayne Wallace are in the US, have shown that um, uh, that the MJO in an atmosphere model can be improved when coupled to an interactive ocean and in this case we used a simple slab ocean model so we used the model's heat flux, so the heat flux from the atmosphere uh, it forced the ocean slab, produced an SST anomaly um, and then, then this fed back into what the atmosphere was responding to. Uh, and so that's, that's, that, that's the equation um, that, that we used for this simple ocean model and what we showed, so these these, um, these panels uh, that I demonstrated showed that kind of various stages. So initially we have the MJO propagating, we have the warm water to the east, the cooler water to the west. So in panel two, uh, what I'm showing there is that we actually showed that when we coupled the ocean, we had increased evaporation uh, to the east and therefore um, a buildup of moisture in the, in the lower atmosphere. And then what we saw due to this destabilisation of the atmosphere to the east was increased zonal moisture convergence in, into this region, which then fed back into the evaporation. So we had this, this feedback between moisture convergence, evaporation, and um, wind, zonal wind. And this increased the moisture, and what we saw was an increase in precipitation 
to the east of the MJO and conversely uh, a reduction in precipitation behind because we had reduced solar insulation and um, cooler, cooler water. And so we saw effectively a speeding up of the MJO envelope as it propagated eastward due to this feedback process. So that's, that's uh, one of the ideas behind um, MJO um, uh, SE interaction and uh, feedback. Uh, as I say, most of the studies that have been done have looked at um, either, uh, you know, either um, low, low level moisture convergence as the main player or evaporation uh, or, or, or both. And in this case, as I showed you, we found that both uh, played a role. So the MJO doesn't just impact uh, weather and climate locally, but also um, outside the tropics. Before I go into that though, I'd like to show you, so I, I mentioned Mojo at the beginning, and um, uh, there's a reason why I did mention that, and that is that the Department of Primary Industries, um, sponsored by the Victorian Government, have put together a really nice animation of the MJO. This is um, a couple of years ago, I think they did this in collaboration with the Bureau, and um, so they have this really nice series, you may have seen them, of of climate dogs that represent and describe and explain um, various drivers around the world, so various climate drivers. So there's one for Enzo, there's one for the Southern Annular Mode, uh, there's one for the Subtropical Ridge, and now there's one for the Madden Julian Oscillation, or Mojo. So I'll try to get this running, and uh, this will be a nice little overview. This is the Very cute. All right. All righty. So, no, that's I don't want that again. Um, there we go. That's the one. Okay. All right. So that's a really nice little um, two-minute animation that they've put together. To, to describe the MJO. And something that they mentioned there, which I didn't um, highlight, is that, is that this isn't just a continually propagating eastward wave. Um, we do see periods where the MJO is quite strong, and in other periods where it's inactive. So we might go you know, a couple or a few months where the MJO doesn't really do very much at all, and then it'll, um, it'll start to um, develop quite, quite strongly. So uh, we do have periods where it's um, where, where its activity does, does fluctuate. And this is actually really important when it comes to the global impacts and some of its influences because in many respects, um, it, so the MJO in terms of, its, of how easy it is to predict or how well it's predicted, and I'll talk about this at the end, is um, so we can predict the MJO out to about three to four weeks. Uh, but beyond that, it's very difficult to predict. Um, and, and it can have very strong in, uh, influences and impacts on, on other global dri uh, drivers and um, uh, weather systems, as I'll, as I'll show you now. So some, some of the direct impacts of the MJO in the tropics are known to include uh, the monsoons. So in terms of the Australian monsoon, it's been shown if you look at active monsoon days as defined um, when, when rainfall during the monsoon season is um, greater than one standard deviation. Uh, it's been shown that if you bin rainfall 
as, as, as defined um, in, that, in that way into MJO phases, then we see that during MJO phases 4, 5, 6 and 7, which is when rainfall and westerlies are increased over northern Australia, we have more active monsoon days than during the other MJO phases. We also know that the MJO has an influence on, or can have, the influ uh, can have an influence on the development of El Nino, and I'll talk about that in more detail um, soon. And as I mentioned, you know, the MJO is a, is a, a coupled structure that, um, uh, that has an, a Kelvin wave component and a Rossby wave component, and those Rossby waves uh, are linked, as I mentioned, to tropical cyclone activity. And so this is an example from March last year. On the 16th of March last year, the MJO reached record amplitude. It had never been observed uh, that strongly. <coughs> and importantly, in the two weeks prior to that event, its build-up was, was again the most intense that we've observed so far. Um, there was, it, it, it really was a, a, um, a very intense event. And part of the reason, and Harry and I showed this in a paper late last year, was that at this stage El Nino was developing. And so what, what we saw over the western uh, to, to central equatorial Pacific was a warm uh, SST anomaly that was associated with the, with, with the building uh, El Nino event. And when the MJO reached this region of warm water, this, this warm water really gave it a kick. And um, as I mentioned, uh, it, it reached record amplitude. So at this time, uh, so this is a plot um, here, just a nice little animation of total precipitable water. And what you can see are uh, quite clearly two tropical cyclones uh, either, either side of the equator that I've, I've just pointed to there. And those were on the western flank of the MJO convective system. So they, they, were, um, they were clearly associated with the MJO um, structure. Outside of the tropics, so extra tropics, we know that the MJO influences weather and climate primarily through um, Rossby wave trains that can develop. So when the MJO convection is over the Indian Ocean, um, we have upper level divergence and the divergence anomaly um, can generate a pressure wave um, that, that um, fires outside the tropics um, in a great circle and it can pass over the northern Pacific and the northern Atlantic and influence climate there. And what, what we know from, from recent studies uh, from about five years ago are that when the MJO convection is over the Indian Ocean, this corresponds um, to the positive phase of the North Atlantic Oscillation about one week later. Uh, it takes about one week for that propagating wave train to influence the North Pacific. Uh, also over the North Pacific there have been heavy rainfall and flood events and cold air outbreaks uh, over US and Canada that also have been associated to certain phases of the MJO. So the MJO really has broad influences uh, both locally in the tropics and remotely over the extra tropics. What we also showed uh, last year for the first time as well, which is quite exciting, was that, was that the MJO also has global impacts on ocean surface wind waves. So we're not talking about the internal wave modes, um, about the waveguides within the ocean, not, not just those, but on actually wind-driven waves at the surface. And these, these are influenced, these are effectively closely tied to the surface wind anomalies. So what I'm showing here for each phase of the MJO are the um, extreme significant wave height anomalies. So extreme we define as being above the 95th percentile, um, extreme surface waves. Um, and we see that these vary with, with uh, the MJO. So as we head into phases four, five, six, seven, the westerly winds of the MJO um, cro um, cross the Indian and Western Pacific Oceans, and accordingly we see an increase in surface waves. <coughs> and that, that increase can be up to about a half a metre. We also see outside of, of this um, direct region influences on, on, on um, waves. So as I mentioned, um, so in the blue up the top, phase three, the blue circle, and phase four, the green circle, we have influences on the North Atlantic and North Pacific, um, and we see the impact on the wind in these regions uh, affect the surface waves. Uh, also in phase five, I'm just highlighting here, 
Uh, we see in the Caribbean and Guatemala and Panama seas there in purple. We see anomalies as well in uh, surface waves and also on the northwest Australian shelf, more uh, locally to us. And locally here in Australia, in terms of rainfall and temperature, as you saw in the, um, in the animation, the MJO has strong impacts. Matt Wheeler a few years ago produced this nice paper looking at the impact of the MJO primarily on Australian rainfall and circulation. And um, what, what he showed was that, was that the strongest influence is the direct influence during our summertime. And that's what I'm showing on the left here. So these are rainfall probabilities. So um, essentially everything that's, that's, um, uh, that's, that's green and blue represents an increased likelihood of rainfall during those phases. So phases four, five, six and seven um, are associated with increased rainfall up north. Um, and the other phases are associated with, um, uh, with, with decreased rainfall. And a few years ago we looked at uh, temperature extremes as well. So for different phases of the MJO, the influence um, on extreme temperature varies. And what we showed here was that also in, in the spring, um, it was a bit of a surprise, there's a very strong influence on, on extreme heat in the southeast, so including uh, here in Victoria and Melbourne. Uh, and this is because, uh, this is due to um, a, a remote teleconnection out of the tropics that can influence uh, the circulation of this region, so we have a large an, um, anticyclone develop in phases two and three during the springtime, uh, and this can lead to to an increased likelihood of extreme heat. Um, and this is just another example on the right, showing um, uh, the influence in phase eight during the summertime. So, so the influences really vary, as I said, by region and by season. Uh, and so you can have a look at this paper if you like, uh, or both both of these papers to see more details uh, on its influence <coughs> on our um, weather and climate in various seasons. I mentioned before as well an, an impact on the development of El Nino. And this has been a really uh, active area of research over the last uh, decade or so. The, oops, so these, these diagrams I'm showing here, many of you have probably seen these before. Um, so the one on the left here is, uh, depicts the normal conditions, um, so during a neutral ENSO, when we don't have a, an El Nino or a La Nina. Uh, we, we know that we have the Indo-Pacific warm pool, so the warmest waters here, um, just to the north of Australia, uh, so Eastern Pacific, sorry, Western Pacific and Eastern Indian Ocean. Uh, the, the, the bulk of convection is over this region, and we have um, a, cool, um, a cold tongue uh, over here, so the cooler SSTs in the Eastern Pacific and uh, suppressed convection. And during El Nino conditions, we know that the warm pool shifts to the east. Uh, we have increased convection over the east, reduced convection over the west, and uh, importantly, the, um, the thermocline uh, in the ocean tilts. So the thermocline is uh, a large temperature gradient that separates the warm, well-mixed water that's near the surface from colder water below. And typically during neutral conditions, it's um, raised in the east and uh, deepened in the west. So we have this kind of tilt of the thermocline. And during El Nino, uh, it, it, it tilts like this. So the east deepens and the west becomes more shallow. So we have um, cooler water reaching the surface and warmer water at the surface in the east. What we know about the MJO is that when the westerly winds enter the western Pacific, this results in surface stress anomalies and these excite uh, Kelvin waves along the thermocline. And what, what these effectively produce um, are, a, um, are a, 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 a warm anomaly that, um, uh, that develops um, along, along the thermocline. So that's associated with downwelling. So we have warmer water uh, along the thermocline. And this, this propagates, as I mentioned, so, Kel so Kelvin waves propagate east. It propagates east into the eastern Pacific region. And because the thermocline is shallower in the eastern Pacific, that, that warm anomaly along the thermocline, so that, so that downwelling Kelvin wave, can reach the surface. Um, and so we know that when we have the MJO um, entering the, the Pacific region, we have Kelvin wave propagation and typically warming in the eastern, 
Pacific Ocean. And so this, this can interact with a developing El Nino and feed back into its development. Because we know that oceanic Kelvin waves are a possible triggering mechanism for, for El Nino. So I'll just show an example, and I'll, I'll keep coming back to this one. This is the record MJO event from last year, but in fact it's not just the record event that I'll talk about here. Last year, early, early last year was, was really quite unusual in terms of MJO activity. In the space of, I think, seven months, we had five MJO events, um, which, was, you know, which was huge. And we know that last year, or now, we're just coming out of, of an El Nino that, was, that, that, that is one of the strongest El Ninos on record that, that, that we've had, certainly um, um, alongside the 97-98 El Nino event. So this is, what I'm showing here is a Hofmoller plot. So this is um, zonal winds. Uh, in, the, in the lower level, 850 hectopascal zonal winds, averaged plus and minus 15 degrees about the equator. So we have an equatorial average, and I'm showing this as a function of longitude uh, along the x-axis, <coughs> and we have time increasing down the screen here. So I've just highlighted March, April, May, June of last year. And this, this here, um, this very strong positive wind anomaly, is the westerly wind anomaly associated with that record MJO event. We, we then had a subsequent event in um, around April, May, and then another near record event um, which, which actually almost, almost surpassed the March event but didn't quite in um, June, July. And what I didn't highlight here was that earlier in that year, around January, February, we also had an MJO event. Um, so one here in January and a weaker one here in February. So we had these five events uh, occur within about seven months. And what we saw as a result of this, particularly following the intense March event, was this Kelvin wave, this very, wa this, this very clear Kelvin wave propagating signal. This is upper ocean heat content anomalies. So, ev so everything that's red here uh, represents positive anomalies, so warming, you know, um, effectively warming along the thermocline, um, which propagates eastward from March following this, this event associated with that one, and we see that, that warm anomaly reach the eastern Pacific um, around uh, early, early May. We had another Kelvin wave here associated with this one. We had another Kelvin wave in June, July, August associated with this one. And these just kept on throwing warm water uh, into the eastern Pacific subsurface. So this is the SST anomaly. And what we saw, particularly following the March event, was an eastward shift in the warm pool. Um, so here we have, we have our SST anomalies kind of building up and the SST um, shifts to the east, so the SST anomaly. When, when we look at the, the total SST field, we also see a shift towards the east. And you can see here the piling up of warm water at the surface associated with the arrival of these Kelvin waves into the eastern Pacific um, as, the, as the El Nino was developing. Um, so what, what we saw here was, was these, these subsequent MJO bursts that kept on firing Kelvin waves along the thermocline and warming the eastern Pacific and um, shifting the warm pool towards the east. And what we saw here was the shift of convection also. So this is outgoing long wave radiation. So everything purple represents increased deep convection. And we see again these, these pulses of convection propagating eastwards with the MJO. And in this particular diagram, we've, we've, we've retained the interannual signal. So what you can see after about April, May is an increase in convection in the central and eastern Pacific, which propagates very slowly. Um, so that's, 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 the inter that's the interannual signal here. So we saw, uh, so we saw this, this convective anomaly established uh, into the central and eastern Pacific uh, following these bursts of the MJO. Um, and so it's been suggested that, um, that the MJO um, uh, influenced the development of El Nino through, through this subsurface activity. And this was also the case in 1997. There have been studies that have looked at this as well. So in November of 96, February of 97, and May of 97, there were very strong MJOs. And we saw similarly an eastward shift in the warm pool um, associated with the development of El Nino. Um, so importantly, we don't think that the MJO causes El Nino. But we have found through various studies that it can influence the, devel the development and the strength of El Nino. So um, 
that's, that's, that's where the current um, uh, research on that um, topic is. So those are some of the global impacts. I hope that, that gives you a fairly good overview that the MJO isn't just you know, something that, that pulses across the tropics and we, and we don't ever really um, you know, kind of hear of it again uh, until its next arrival, but it can influence weather um, right throughout Australia, uh, up into the northern hemisphere um, and, um, and uh, elsewhere, both in the atmospheric and the surface fields. It has, it has ver very far-reaching effects. I've spoken a lot about the MJO um, index and about various phases of the MJO. So what I'll do now, finally, is to introduce you to, to this index in a bit more detail and specifically talk about how we, how we monitor and how we measure the MJO. Because I've been speaking a lot about anomalies and the MJO is very difficult to detect in, in total field because there is so much noise. You know, there's, there's weather noise, there's interannual noise um, and and the MJO explains about 25% about of, of the subseasonal variance in, in the tropics. So there are other sources of, of subseasonal variability that uh, get all tied up. So what we used to do um, a lot, and I mean we still do in, in, in various um, applications, but, but what, what, what we used to really focus on to, to, um, to pull out modes of the MJO and to demonstrate its, its, its um, propagation is to conduct uh, a spectral analysis. So I spoke about fast Fourier transforms before and about taking a, a, a field in space and time, so outgoing long wave radiation, for example, and um, expressing that field in terms of, of its periodicity and wave number. Uh, and so here is that dispersion diagram for OLR again, but just taken from a different study. So here's the MJO sitting around zonal wave numbers, so eastward propagating zonal wave numbers one to six, roughly and um, periods uh, 30 to 60 or 30 to 80 days. And so what we did a lot was to, was to compute this FFT and outside of this MJO box we would set everything to zero, all the, all the, all the numbers to zero and then we'd, then we'd perform the inverse FFT. And what that left us with was a, was a, was a, a bandpass filtered field. And these, these, um, these kind of purple ellipses here are the, um, are the contours for that bandpass filtered field sitting on top of the anomaly field for OLR. So these, these essentially highlight the, the eastward propagating bands. So you can see these associated with, with um, MJO activity uh, for this example shown in um, 2005 to 2007. So this is a really nice way of diagnosing the MJO by pulling out these, these, these wave numbers and periods. Um, but it's, it's difficult to use for, for, for prediction because in order to diagnose this field and to, you know, and, and to um, describe these, the, these fields in these discrete, in, in these discrete um, periods and wave numbers, we, we, we need typically um, several, several years of data that, that, that we can produce the FFT on. Um, so when it comes to prediction, of course, that's difficult because we're predicting, you know, maybe a few months ahead. So ten, ten years ago, as I mentioned earlier, Matt Wheeler and Harry Hendon um, really kind of solved this problem by, by developing a really nice index that uses empirical orthogonal functions, so, so EOFs. Uh, and what they did uh, was to, so they called this the, the real-time MJO multivariate index, and this is the old schematic, and I showed this in the first couple of slides. Uh, and I spoke about these phases. What they did here was, was to take the three fields uh, for which the MJO is most coherent. So I mentioned earlier these are outgoing long wave radiation, 850 hectopascal zonal winds and 200 hectopascal zonal winds. And they averaged these about the, about the equator, so I spoke about that, averaging 15 north to 15 south. They removed interannual variability um, and they standardized each of these, so they normalized them by their, own, by their standard deviation so that they each contributed equally to the analysis. And then they combined the fields and they produced an EOF analysis. And what this does is it pulls out the major modes of variability. Uh, and because they've removed interannual variability, they've averaged about the equator, um, and so they're essentially pulling out the large-scale structure of the MJO. So by taking the first two modes of the EOFs, so EOF1, EOF2, um, these both explain about 12.5% of the variance. So I mentioned that the MJO 
describes about 25 per cent. So each of these modes, EUF1, EUF2, uh, describe about equal variance. So taken together, they, um, they depict the eastward propagation of the MJO. You can see that, of course, by design, by this analysis, EUF2 lags EUF1 by about 90 degrees. Um, so they describe the propagation. And these, these are the spatial structures of uh, OLR here in, in the, the, the dark solid curve, um, U200 in the light, sol col so the light um, solid curve, and um, U850 in the dash curve. So you can see that EUF2 is shifted to the right in longitude uh, by about 90 degrees compared to EUF1. And so what, what you do, uh, so knowing these structures, and this is based on 30 years of observations, they've pulled out these two structures. And so all you do when you have data now, when you have a forecast, is for each, for, say, say for each day, if you're looking at daily data, for these three fields, you average them about the equator and you project them onto these two EOFs. And these produce a principal component time series. Or in other words, they produce a time series that depicts the propagation of the MJO. So you don't need to do this large um, bandpass filtering using several years of data anymore. You simply take these two spatial patterns and you project data onto them. And it's, it's a really nice way of diagnosing the MJO. And now every modelling centre around the world uses this technique to forecast the MJO. So this is an example where you plot the time series that, that come out through this technique. So RMM1 is uh, the solid curve, RMM2 is the dash curve, or the dotted curve. And you can see, uh, of course, um, that, that RMM2 lags RMM1 in space. So this is an example from 2002. And what you simply do then uh, to, to track the path of the MJO is to, is to plot RMM1 against RMM2 in, uh, as an XY plot. And when, and when you do this, you'll get a point on the plot, you'll do it for the next day, you'll get another point, you'll do it for the following day, etc., etc. And you trace out an anti-cyclone... Uh, sorry, an, an, anti uh, uh, an anti-clockwise um, path around this phase space diagram. And, and the MJO moves like this, uh, as I'm showing with the mouse. Uh, and so as you track each, each day forward, you get this, this anti-clockwise motion. And sometimes the MJO kind of wiggles about in here, in the very center. Um, so when the, when the index here value is less than one, one in standardized units, we, we define that to be a weak MJO. We don't, you know, it's, it's quite difficult to, to detect its activity. But then at other times, we see it come outside this unit circle, uh, as is shown in this particular example. And uh, we, we can then measure its strength and its position around the globe based on this index. And what Matt and Harry did was simply to divide this, this, um, this diagram up into eight different phases, which, which correspond nicely with that original schematic I showed from the Madden Julian paper. And such that when, the, when, when, when we plot a point here which falls within phases two and three, uh, they, they defined this to be uh, when we have convective activity over the Indian Ocean. Uh, as I mentioned, four and five over the maritime continent, phases six and seven over the Western Pacific, and phases eight and one over the Western Hemisphere in Africa. So this, this, um, this essentially tell us, uh, t tells us how, how the MJO varies uh, on the sub-seasonal time scale when we um, analyse these fields in this way. And at the Bureau, we monitor the MJO. So we have a nice MJO page, which you would have seen uh, listed in the animation, the Mojo animation. And here's the link, so bomb.gov.au slash climate slash MJO. Uh, and so this is an example from, from that record event I keep on coming back to. Um, so the blue curve here, I think th this is, yeah, this is 40 days of observations. And you can go to this page and have a look at the latest, uh, the latest tracking of the MJO as well as, as the archive for several years in the past. And this blue curve, for example, highlights the tracking of the MJO as it, as it reached the western to central Pacific region and um, uh, reached its, its um, record amplitude. So the last couple of slides are with regards to MJO prediction. And so we use this index to to produce deterministic uh, forecasts. So what this means essentially is we're plotting from, from a dynamical climate model in which we run several ensemble members to produce an ensemble mean forecast. 
what we do, uh, and you can go to the Poama uh, webpage, which is our um, seasonal, uh, our sub-seasonal or seasonal climate model at the Bureau. And you can look at the tracking of the MJO for the last two weeks, as is shown here in grey, and then the forecast for the next 40 days. And so again, as I mentioned, by projecting the forecast data onto these EOF patterns, we can track the predicted path of the MJO. Each of these um, faint coloured curves represents each of the 33 ensemble members from that model, and the black is the ensemble mean. Um, so this is just one such example where we can track the uh, forecast. Um, models generally do a pretty good job at predicting the MJO. As I mentioned, we have skill out to about three to four weeks. Currently, that's our, that's our, um, uh, that's our best skill achieved. Um, so, Poama, so this is from a, a study of eight different climate models from uh, last year, Nina et al. Uh, the Bureau features in here, this is our, our current model, Poama 2, and we're about to move, move to the access model soon. Um, and here's our limit of skill. So if, if you look at the, the, um, the kind of the cross hatching here, you can see that, that the limit of skill for Poama is out to about two and a half weeks, uh, sorry, about three and a half weeks. Uh, and the best model so far is the ECMWF model. That, that shows prediction out to about four weeks. Uh, the ECMWF model has quite high horizontal resolution now. Uh, Poama is still quite low horizontal resolution, but because we're moving to access, as I mentioned, the access model, which is much higher resolution uh, than Poama. Um, and so far we've done some early analyses and we've shown that at certain times of the year the skill is, is uh, improved uh, compared to Poama. Uh, finally, this is, something, this is something new that, um, that we're just preparing uh, a paper for. And it's trying uh, a different MJO forecast metric. Okay, so in the last slide I showed this, de this deterministic metric where you look at the ensemble mean. So we're, we're looking at, at a probabilistic forecast. We know that on the sub-seasonal time scale, probabilistic forecasts uh, have a lot of value and in many, many instances more value than a deterministic forecast. We can talk about the chance of something occurring um, rather than giving an absolute value, uh, p particularly when, you know, when we're kind of looking towards the limit of skill. So what, what we're doing here is to, so this is for that same example, the record event from last year. And what, what we've done is that we've broken the forecast up into five day chunks. Um, so days one to five, which is up the top left here, days six to uh, 10, uh, 11 to 15, etc., up to 40 days. And what we're depicting here is, is the probability of the MJO occurring in a given phase. So for each phase, we essentially count up the number of ensemble members that predict the MJO to be in that phase for that period that we're interested in. And then we divide that by the total number of ensemble members that we have, and that gives us the probability, basically, of being in each phase. So we can see for that record event, um, reds represent a high likelihood of being in that phase at that time during that pentad, and um, yellows represent um, lower probabilities. So we can see for that particular event, you know, in the first five days of the forecast, we had our highest probability of being in phase six. Uh, for the subsequent five days, we had the highest probability of being in phase seven. Um, the same thing for days 11 to 15, and we can see how that varies um, as the forecast evolves. Um, and the black here, just for comparison, gives that deterministic ensemble mean forecast. So we can see how that ensemble mean compared with where...